ready to start? Guys, two minutes early. Good morning, church. Great to see you. Welcome to all in the First United Methodist Church. We exist to get you connected to Jesus Christ. I'm really excited about today. God just put something big on my heart, and we're going to be sharing that today. And uh, we're just here to worship the Lord. The only I have only one announcement today, and that is it's Communion Sunday. And if you're listening to us, following us on Facebook, immediately following the service at 8 and 10, I'll be outside to give you communion if you want to drive by and do that. If you don't see anybody, just honk. We'll try to be out there for about 15 minutes. So we invite you guys to come and be a part of us. Amen? Amen. Oh, God's fire is cool, man. And we're going to be talking about the fire of God and what he does today in deeper waters. Gracious Lord, we're here. Fill us. Set us free. We just want to be consumed by you. You are our audience and that's all we desire. In Jesus' name, come. Fill us. Just let us let go and let you all over the place. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord. All right, stand and sing with us this morning. We are in the Father's house. Hallelujah. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. And my story isn't over if my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. No failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
you that we can come into your house because, Father, you welcome us into your house because we are your children, Father. We thank you that we can come boldly before you and worship you this day and give you praise and glory. Father, set our hearts on fire this day to burn for you, Lord, in Jesus' name. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify. a strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name, let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say, but your name, yes, we thank you for your name. Jesus, in your name we pray, come and fill our hearts today. Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say but your name. Hear my cry, O oh God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder. Cause nothing has the power to say But your name Is a strong and mighty tower Your name Is a shelter like no other Your name Let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to say your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say. Amen. And God is good. All the time. And all the time. Hey, turn, wave to each other. We want to say welcome to you, for you that are watching us on Facebook Live here and around the nation. And also those that will be listening to us on the radio at 10 o'clock today. Glad that you are with us. Amen. Amen. Hey, as we uh, approach a time of, uh, of, of prayer this morning, I just want to... Uh, Lift up uh, what's going on up here. Some of you might not have been here last week. But the Lord put upon my heart. You know, if, ra if a revival is really to come, it's going to come as people respond to come back home. And uh, we have uh, made a call last week for people to respond to those who are on their heart who aren't connected with Jesus Christ or like they used to be or even some that have never been connected. 
And uh, the scripture says, you know, heaven rejoices as prodigals come home. As people re-engage with God, heaven rejoices. So we invited people to come and lift up those that are on their hearts, their family, their friends, their spouses, whoever it may be. And we've had 80 names come on, on these two paintings. These paintings represent prodigal sons and prodigal daughters. And this morning as we come for a time of prayer, and if you have someone heavy on your heart, we invite you to come and place those prodigal sons and prodigal daughters. And we're, we pray over their names throughout the week. Amen? All heaven rejoices when just one comes home. What if 80 come back? We're going to stand with you on that. Amen? So as we come to a time of prayer this morning... Uh, had a lot of people in and out of the hospitals uh, the last uh, week or so. We, we, there's a, a prayer request out there that we're going to be lifting up, I think, on Wednesdays. Uh, we're going to lift up Carol Redman in prayer as uh, she's going to be having some surgery. And we just ask the Lord's anointing to be upon this, this precious woman of God who just pours our heart. She just wants people to, to fall deeper in love with Jesus. Amen. And now it's time for us to pour into her. So we've been pouring into others. Steve, you going to be taking off this week? Steve Schoner, we're going to be lifting you up. Steve, Steve's been going to go down to Haiti and uh, re-engage in the ministries that he's been a part of for years. And we want to be lifting up Steve on his uh, travels down there and his safety. And God, God's got something big for you down there. Just keep pressing in. Keep going. Amen. And as we have a time of stillness, I would like for you to lift up my mom. She's in the hospital right now, and, and uh, she had something that happened about four or five years ago, and she's back in there, and uh, she might be getting out today, but I'm going to go down and, and check on her and, and uh, have prayer and uh, anoint her. And just lifting up the dimensions we find ourselves with the COVID-19 and people uh, getting uh, kind of sick from having the second shot or other things that are out there. And I just ask you really prayerfully pray about um, the shots and the things that are, that, that are going on out there. Just, just continue to pray about your decisions you make. Amen? And uh, we, we want to be free. And, uh, but but we, we, we want God to be all over this and not man and woman be all over this. So as we come for a time of stillness before the Lord, if you have a prodigal son or daughter, a prodigal on your heart, we invite you to come. Maybe you've already written a name and you just want to press in or you just want to stand in and just lay your hands towards these paintings and this list of names as we seek the Lord's face, His glorious presence. Let's have, a, have, a, have some moments of stillness before Him right now, followed by our fellowship prayer and our Lord's prayer. Lord, we want to satisfy you. Lord, we want to be your children that you look at and smile. Lord, we desire, Lord, to have our hearts beat according to your heartbeat. We want to see people with the eyes that you see people. We desire, Lord, to be more and more like Jesus in every way we think. In every way we respond. In every way. On earth. As it is in heaven. Our Lord God. We thank you Lord for the, your moves. That have gone around this world throughout the last millenniums. 
We ask you, Lord, for us to be engaged in your movements of the here and now. And to prepare us, Lord, to be part of the third great awakening as you are stirring the church around the world. We want to be in your will. I was praying with Tommy Hayes, Lord, the other day. I just felt in my heart, just, I just had to say, I want to finish well with God. Lord, may we, from this day forth, our desire to finish with you well. Holy Spirit, come equip us. Jesus' blood, come and soak us. Lord, let our knees get worn out and let our voices get scratchy as we've been crying out to you. Bless, Lord, those who are on these prayer lists. Bless, Lord, the prodigal sons and daughters, the 80-plus that are on this list. In the name of Jesus, holy angels, go and just give them, clear a path for them to respond. Lord, you want people to respond because they want to respond. Clear that path. So they can respond, so they have a chance to truly hear and truly respond to you in Jesus' name. We just give you praise. We lift up Carol, Lord. Bless, Lord, this precious woman. Your will be done for her. Lord, be all over Steve, Lord, like peanut butters all over bread. And everywhere, Lord, you go prepare every place, every step. Before he's taking a step, you've already been there, Holy Spirit, in a powerful way. Go behind, above, below, all over him. Lord, I lift up my mom above all things, Lord. I want her to know you deeper and wider. So, Lord, be with her. Be with Shirley. We ask you, Lord, to be with, Lord, all those shut-ins and those, Lord, who are struggling with, with all kinds of dimensions that are out there, from finances to relational to jobs. Lord, your perfect love casts out all fear. And as we join our hearts together, we come against this uh, worldwide pandemic sent by the enemy to disrupt lives. And we say, we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. We're going to listen to his voice. We're going to do hidden things his way. As we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You got that shot out of adrenaline in you now? I praise God. Amen. Cheryl? Well, a lot of times, um, I'm just speaking to you guys, the kids at heart, and hopefully you feel the way I do. One of the youth asked me about a week and a half ago how old I was, and when I told her, she got this horrified look on her face, which did not make me feel better, but I said, inside I still feel like I'm about Michael and Sophie's age. So hopefully you guys feel that way. And what I want to talk today is about how humans want to be the best. How many of you have ever gotten a trophy? This is my trophy from 1983 when I got second place in the spelling bee at my school in San Antonio. Okay? If I'd gotten first place, obviously it would have been a lot bigger. And another way we show we want to be the best is arguing with people. My brothers and I used to argue all the time about who had done something better who learned something faster, etc. And of course, my parents had to listen to this, which they just loved, as you love when your children do the same things, I'm sure. Well, I've been talking to the kids about things Jesus has done during this time of Lent, and Jesus had to deal with the same thing. In Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 35, 
They're walking along, and two of his disciples were talking, and Jesus asked them, what were you discussing on the road? But they didn't answer because they'd been arguing about which of them was the greatest. So he sat down, called the 12 disciples over to him, and said, you all heard this lesson, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. Quit worrying about whether you're winning a trophy or whether you're the best at something. Those who want to be first have to put themselves last. And then we know what he did next. He put a little child among them and said, anyone who welcomes a child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And they welcome not only me, but also the Father who sent me. Last week we talked about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Perfect example. He put himself last. And what does this mean for us? As we go through this week and do things, we're supposed to do them for God's glory, not for our own, not to win a prize, a trophy, or to be better than someone Amen. else. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for the lessons it teaches us. Thank you for all the children of this church. We ask that you continue to bless them and guide them as they grow stronger in you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 This morning, Lisa is going to share with you some three Old Testament scriptures. It's about being consecrated, set apart for God. One of them has to deal with how people respond when God moves. And the final one deals with what happens when you're consecrated and you still want to do it your way. Would you please rise for the reading of God's holy word from the book of Leviticus. Next, Moses presented the second ram, which was the ram of ordination. Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head as Moses slaughtered it. Then Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, the thumb of his right hand, and the big toe of his right foot. Next, he presented Aaron's sons and put some of the blood on the lobe of their right ears, the thumb of their right hands, and the big toe of their right feet, consecrating them to God. He then sprinkled the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. After the ordination ceremony eight days later, Aaron raised his hands toward the people and blessed them. Then after presenting the sin offering, the whole burnt offering, and the peace offering, he stepped down from the altar. Next, Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle, and when they came back out, they blessed the people again, and the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to the whole community. Fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When the people saw all this, they shouted with joy and fell down, face down on the ground. Eight days later, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over it. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him strange fire that God had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died there before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord meant when he said, I will show myself holy among those who are near me. I will be glorified before all the people. And Aaron was silent. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon the gathering of our tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your provision. Lord, uh, there's not enough words, not enough paper for us to thank you in our praises. We just turn to you. Bless, Lord, the gathering. We ask you, Lord, to bless those that are struggling. We pray, Lord, we may be all we can be to be the hands and feet of Jesus here and around the world. In Jesus' strong name, amen. Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not 
trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails here, lovely face. I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I there in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Holy Spirit, just guide and direct, Lord. The words, Lord, that be said, the things that will be read, may your holy presence be welcome, and may we respond in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Mardi Gras is sold to everyone to be a time of celebration before Lent. I've asked some people that are on the streets of Mardi Gras saying, well, what, do you, what, is, Mar what is Mardi Gras all about? And many times the response to the people is this. So we can get the sinning out of our system. So we can get the sinning out of our system. Fred Bishop says, the founder of No Greater Love Ministry says, this is an attitude we see at Mardi Gras all the time. And it's an attitude that leads to destruction. Bad theology leads to disappointing eternity. Letting the world culture shape the church leads always to a falling away from God. It always has, and it always will. That's why we need champions for God. Champions like Moses, Daniel, and Ezekiel, and Elijah, Elisha, Joshua. Champions like Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, God strongly proclaims that he has not called Isaiah and anointed him and consecrated him just to have him sit there and burn some time. God called Isaiah to be his spokesperson. And for Isaiah not to be alarmed when his proclamations would fall upon deaf ears, God said, don't worry about that, just do. May we hear this morning the good news, which is found in the old news of the Hebrew text. Isaiah 12 is about who, why, and where to praise the Lord. Stand, please, for the reading of God's holy word. In that day you will sing, praise the Lord. He was angry with me, but now he comforts me. See, God has come to save me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will drink deeply from the fountains of salvation. In that wonderful day, you will sing, thank the Lord, praise his name, tell the world what he has done. Oh, how mighty he is. 
Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praises around the world. Let all the people of Jerusalem shout his praise with joy, for great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is surprising to see what can happen or what fails to happen to those who are close to God. So many brain cramps, so little time, so few chapters. Moses and the children of Israel sometimes show us what, how wonderful it is to be in unity and community and oneness with God, while on the other, time, other hand, in a very short time, they show how rebellion and stupidity can move in so quickly and disrupt that relationship. The Israelites vowed three times before Moses went up to get the commandments. We will certainly do everything the Lord has asked. We're in it. We're sold out. They, they saw God. They saw the glorious presence. They had dinner with him, some of the leaders. Moses then goes up to Mount Sinai to receive the commandments written in stone, the Big Ten. And he's gone for about three or four weeks. <laughs> it should have been three or four decades, it seems, but it was only three or four weeks. And then Aaron, who had seen firsthand and helped lead the people out with Moses, God's power and majesty is convinced by the leaders of the Israelites, the laity, that they need to walk away from this God and embrace and re-embrace the gods of Egypt, the same gods that were so powerless against Yahweh. Moses goes back down. God's holy anger is there. 3,000 are killed. People's hearts return to God. The message is simple. God is holy, and his holiness will not be mocked. Then Moses goes back up, and God says, you know, I just need to just wipe him out. But Moses says, I'm still willing to lead. And God is pleased with Moses, puts him in the cleft of the rock, walks by Moses, shielding him from his glorious presence. And, the, and God says his name and what he's all about. And he says, I am the Lord, and I am merciful. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. I am faithful. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilt. For the guilt of the sin must be paid for, friends. Then Moses receives another cut of the Ten Commandments and returns to the people. Holy, holy, holy. Just as the angels sang, is the Lord God Almighty. Romans 12, 1 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is that too much to ask? I urge you, brothers, to view God, how merciful he's been. Offer your bodies up as a living and holy sacrifice. Do you hear God this morning saying to you, give yourself, your wholeness, your body to God and let it be a living, breathing sacrifice, holy sacrifice to him. Sacrifice. Meaning, what is one willing to give God? Friends, you got to mean what you say when it comes to your walk with God. He calls us to be holy, for us to be set apart for his holy use, for us to obtain the heart, the mind, the spirit of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says, The God who calls you is faithful, and he will do this if you cry out to him. It's God who calls you and I. It's God who calls us to be holy. 
to go forth into the cities, into the counties, into the nations. As God has called Isaiah forth into holiness, so he calls you and I. Confession of one's sin in and of itself is not enough to en 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 enable the believer to automatically walk in the Spirit. She or he must come, become a yielded instrument for God's service. This yielding must not be thought of simply of a willingness to do some specific thing. Rather, it consists of a dedication by the person to do whatever God has asked. You cannot separate God from his character of holiness. Holiness and God stick as close together as peanut butter is on bread. And remember, friends, God will not be mocked. Again, Romans 12, 1, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind that he will accept. God has not called me to be a chaplain here at Olney first. I'm the wrong person to sit back and watch this church get put into the grave. For I believe in my heart that God wants us to live. Every one of us to have abundant life in Christ, no matter how young or how old. Satan, though, wants us to die. Jesus, though, wants to give us life. John 10, 10b says, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. Though it's red letter edition. He wants you to live and live in his abundance. Nothing one does can make one holy. You can't force God's hand, but you can open your heart and be saturated with the Lord's presence. Sadly, though, in some Methodist circles and in other denominations, God's grace, the mercy of God's grace is preached and interpreted to a point which lets some believers believe that they can do anything they want and live any way that they want because God's grace will cover it. <laughs> Don't worry, he'll forgive you. John Wesley had a word for this. It was called antinomianism. In other words, cheap grace. John Wesley feared this more than anything else. He feared that there would come a time when the Methodist people, in their heart, would embrace cheap grace. The Christians would take God's grace and twist it and use it as a blessing to sin or to continue in sin. Friends, that's a bad case of Mardi Gras syndrome. <laughs> it is. Living any way you want. Don't worry about it. God is a God of love and he forgives. That's very wishy-washy. Antinomianism means that there is no norms. There's no norms when it comes to how people behave. There are no rights. There are no wrongs. It's just whatever I want to do. But holiness, friends, is not cheap. It's not founded upon the influence of the externals, but from the influences of the internal, the Holy Spirit fire that dwells in you. For true holiness is a heart issue. It's not based upon the do's and don'ts, the externals. It's based upon God living in us and letting the Holy Spirit guide and direct and form us and shape us. Holiness, one person defines as, is a crucifixion of the outer man, a crucifixion of the outer woman, so that the holiness of Jesus can come through the life and the lifestyle of that person. So a holy God can have fellowship with his holy people. Again, holiness is a condition of the heart. The purity 
of a life purified by God. The purity of your mind, the purifying of your actions and how you react, purifying of, 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 of your whole mode of life and lifestyles. And may I say, it purifies how you worship God. <laughs> Holiness of God in your life has a way of washing out the tongue, rinsing out the eyes, unplugging the ears, cleansing the heart, and pointing your feet in the direction of the Lord and traveling to him. His desires for your life and for those that you love are what we should have and what we should embrace. Yet, there is a starting gate. Or may I say, there is a restarting gate that many of us may want to have this morning. Especially if once we were walking so close to God, but now he seems so far off. I believe the Holy Spirit is calling, is wooing us back into the deeper waters in relationship with the Lord through our cry out of the prodigals, praying for the lost in our homes, in our city, in our county, in our families, our friendships. Holy Spirit is calling us to our knees for those we love to come home. But unless we desire all of God in us, all of God in our church family, then empowerment of the prodigal revival will falter. But there is hope and a story to be told. Here is a picture. England is in purple. Ireland is in green. Wales is in a darker green. Scotland is in purple. And the islands in the northwest part of Scotland, go ahead, Lisa, next. The islands in the north are part of the story we want to talk about. And they're known as the Hebronese Islands. The Hebronese Islands. I want to finish the message this morning before communion on the short story about the Hammerdean revival, 1949 to 1952. There had been a great revival in the islands of Herbanese, especially in northern islands called Lewis in the 1820s and 1830s. They had major moves of God, but as the years and decades passed, the fire of God grew cold. Sound familiar? The following are stories, the excerpts from the Reverend Duncan Campbell, the Scottish evangelist who helped to lead the Herbanese revival. He writes, in 1949, people were deeply burdened by the lack of genuine worship in the church. In 1949, the Holy Spirit began to break out as people in the southern islands of the Hermanese were pressed into intercession because there was a great concern that the church seemed powerless to hold on to the young people. The young had grown especially indifferent to the gospel message as it seemed to them to be so common and so dull. And it was bringing death to the churches there. A movement of God began in the island of Lewis, the northern island. Two old women, one of them 84, double bent over with arthritis, and her other 82 was stone blind. Their names were Peggy and Christine Smith, were greatly burdened because the appalling state of their own church or parish. It was true that not a single young person attended their public worship. Not a single young man or woman went to church. And those two women were greatly concerned, and they made a special matter to pray about it. Though they couldn't attend church because of their physical conditions, they became the intercessors, the prayer warriors, crying out to God for the island to come back to him. A verse gripped the ladies. I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. They were so burdened that both of them decided to spend great amounts of prayer twice a week. On Tuesdays, they would get on their knees at 10 o'clock in the evening and not get off of them till 4 a.m. 
two of them. Very humble, living in humble dwellings, crying out to God on Tuesdays and Thursdays. One night, one of the sisters had a vision, and the vision she saw in the church was the, a vision of her father's church was now crowded with people, packed to the door. And a strange minister was standing in the pulpit. She was so impressed by the vision that she sent for her own minister. And of course, the minister, knowing the two sisters, knew that they were two women who knew God and had a wonderful way with God. He responded to their invitation. One of the sisters said to the minister, you must do something about this. And I would suggest that you call your office bearers together, spend with us at least two nights in prayer every week. Let's do it on Tuesdays and Fridays. And if you gather the elders together, you can meet in a barn, in a farm community somewhere. You can meet in a barn, and you can pray there, and we will pray where we are. And guess what? It's exactly what they did. The minister called his office bearers together, and seven of them met in a barn to pray on Tuesdays and Fridays, and the two older ladies joined them on their knees in their home. This continued for several weeks. Duncan uh, Campbell writes, I believe almost a month and a half until one night it happened. They were kneeling there in the barn, pleading the promise, I will pour out water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. When one of the young men, a deacon in the church, got up and read the 24th Psalm. Who shall ascend the hill of God? Who shall stand in the holy place? He who has clean hands and pure heart, who has not lifted his soul up vain vanity or sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings. He not receive a blessing, but the blessing of the Lord. And then the young man closed his Bible, and looking down at the ministers and others in front of him, he said, it seems to me to be so much a humbug to be praying as we are praying, to be waiting as we are waiting, if we ourselves are not rightly related to God. And then he lifted his two hands and said, God, are my hands clean? God, is my heart pure? He got no further. The young man fell upon his knees. He fell upon the floor. And he seemed to fall into some kind of a trance. And in the words of the ministers that had gathered there, they said, and at that moment, he and the other officers, the, the office bearers, were gripped with the conviction that a God-sent revival must ever be related to holiness. And must, never be and must be related to the godliness in their lives. When that happened in that barn, the power of God swept into the churches. And an awareness of God gripped the community such that they had not seen for over 100 years. An awareness of God, and that's the revival. Revival is when people become really aware of God. And on the following day, the wool looms were silent. Little work was done on the farms as men and women, get, men and women gathered themselves to think on eternal things gripped by eternal realities. Now, Duncan Campbell wasn't on, hand, on the island when it happened. Campbell said, but again, one of the sisters sent from the minister. She says, I think you ought to invite someone to the parish. I cannot give you the man's name. I just see him in my mind. He's a stranger. I see a stranger in our pulpit, but he's out there somewhere. And so someone gave a call to Campbell. And first he refused to come. But then the Holy Spirit, in the middle of a revival that he was beginning in Ireland, in the middle of the revival, he gets up and says, the Holy Spirit is calling me away. And he leaves immediately and goes to the Hebrides Islands. He doesn't know what awaits. He just says, God's calling me. 
He was planning to go there for 10 days. He wound up being there for two years. I'm getting ahead of myself. Campbell writes, I shall never forget the night I arrived at the pier in the main steamer. The minister met me there and says, I know, Mr. Campbell, that you're very tired. You've been traveling all day by train and, and, and to begin with, and now you wind up on the steam liner. And I am sure that you are ready for your supper and ready for your bed, but I wonder if you would be prepared to address a meeting in our church this evening at 9 o'clock on our way home. It will be a short meeting, and then we will make it home and give you supper and get you in your bed and get you rested for tomorrow evening's service. Campbell writes, we got to the church about quarter to nine. I found 300 people gathered there. I gave an address. Nothing really happened during the service. It was a good message. A sense of God, a consciousness of his spirit was moving, but nothing really beyond that. So I pronounced the benediction, and we were leaving the church, I would say, about a quarter to 11. Just a, a brief message. And just as walking down the aisles, along with a young deacon who had been reading that read Psalm 24 in that barn that night, that man suddenly stood up in the aisle, looked up to heaven and said, God, you can't fail us. God, you can't fail us. You promised to pour water on the, the thirsty and flood upon the dry ground. God, you can't fail us. And as soon as he cried out, he hit his knees and was slain in the spirit. And just then the door opened. It was 11 o'clock. The local blacksmith came running in saying, Mr. Campbell, something wonderful's happened. Oh, we were praying that God would pour water out on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. He has done it. He has done it. And Campbell said he went to the door of the church and he opened up. 600 people were standing outside the church. 600. Where did they come from? What had happened? And Campbell says, I believe that very night Pentecost began to sweep across the land as it had with the apostles. Here's the good thing. Over 100 young people were at a dance while that service was going on. They weren't thinking about God. They weren't thinking about eternity. God was not in their thoughts at all. They wanted to dance. They were having a good time when suddenly, uh-oh, <laughs> that's a Bible one. When suddenly the power of God fell at the dance floor and they fled from the hall as a man flees from the plague and they made their way to the church and were standing outside a hundred young people. God had called them to the church and the people came in and they laid upon the floor crying out to God. Campbell tried to make it to the pulpit, but there was a lady who had graduated from university. She laid there blocking the pulpit, and she was crying out saying, Is there mercy for me, O oh God? Is there mercy for me, O oh God? Is there mercy for me, O oh God? Men and women who had gone to bed got up suddenly, got dressed, and made it to the church past midnight. Nothing in the way of publicity was given except next Sunday we're going to have a speaker. A certain man was going to be here for just 10 days. But God took the situation in hand. Oh, he became his own publicity agent. And a hunger and thirst gripped the people. 600 of them and were now at this church standing outside and laying inside. Campbell writes, when God stepped suddenly, men and women all over the parish were gripped by the fear of God. He never gave an altar call. He let the Holy Spirit do it. He said, be walking down the roads and see people just in ditches crying out to God. Crying out to God. He would just walk by and say, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do the walk. Duncan writes, revival is a community saturated with God. Revival is community saturated with God. 
Revival happens when we let God saturate us. In closing, I want to do a reading out of Romans 12, 1, 12, 1 through 2. Again, hear this again. So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Be kind, he will accept. It, the, the kind that he will accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is it too much to ask? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants to do. And you will know how good and how pleasing and perfect his will really is. So friends, let's cast our nets out there. Let's throw our hearts out to God this morning. Let's write the names of the prodigals. Let's press in and be faithful. Let's allow God to touch. Present your whole self, body, soul, and spirit to be holy before God. May we consecrate our life and give it back to God. Let it be a living and holy sacrifice. I don't know about you, but I want my prodigal. <laughs> My prodigals that I've written. I will rejoice today when I hear, Is there mercy for me, O Lord? Is there mercy for me, O Lord? Is there mercy for me, O Lord? Amen. Hey, let's have dinner with Jesus. Jesus met with the twelve in the upper room. He took bread, gave thanks and praise, gave it to his disciples, said, now take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body that is broken for you. Blessed is she and blessed is he who come and eat. And as you do this, remember I am laying my life down for you. Remember as you come together and have communion. When supper was ended, he took a cup filled with fruit of the vine. He gave it to his disciples and said, Now take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. My blood will wash away your sins. You will be restored back to oneness with my Father. Come, drink, come eat. Do this in remembrance of me. Holy Spirit, send your presence upon this bread and upon this fruit of the vine. And by your presence here, Jesus, this becomes a holy and living sacrifice. Our spiritual food for our journey. We're not worthy to receive you, Lord. But you're the one who calls. And we ask you, Lord, as we feed upon your promises, we feed upon the spiritual food. May you touch the prodigals in our heart. May you woo them to your dinner soon. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. Amen. Cheryl. God invites everybody to come. You do not need to be a United Methodist. You do not need to be a member of our church, but he's the one who calls you. Call, come because he loves you. He wants to bless you, and he wants you to walk with him. I invite you to come. Sure. The body of Christ broken. body of Christ.
body of Christ. Peggy, the body of Christ. Jeff, the body of Christ. Amen. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. stand. Now may you go in peace to love and serve each other. May you also, as John Wesley did, expect God to move. One of the powerful things that made Methodists Methodists, they knew God, not just of him, they knew him and they knew he would move and he did. It's not too late. <laughs> The Hebrides revival cries out what happens when a people just get before God. Lord, may it be so. May it be here in this church and community. In Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. In case you haven't heard, uh, Cheryl got married. <laughs> Thought you all should know. And Jeff's the United Methodist pastor, and uh, he's been assigned to another church starting July the 1st. So Cheryl's going to be with us for a, a few more months, and we're going to have a big old party and say goodbye. But thank you for being faithful, and just keep your eyes upon the Lord as you have, always have. Amen.
May we go in peace to love and serve the Lord and know that God is good. And all the time. Have a great week. Press in, friends. The prodigals are calling. Let's bring them home. Let's bring them home. Amen. Lord, bless the Lord. All, every name that's on here, right here and now. And the names that come, in Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen.